Hi, Zach Reiser here, and welcome back to another Base Effects Review video. Today, I am incredibly excited to dig into the C4 synth from Source Audio. I have been eagerly awaiting the arrival of my C4 for a very long time, and to be honest, I'm a little bit behind the curve here. There are lots and lots of really good demos out there showing all kinds of sound possibilities with the C4. But I want this video to be a little bit different than all the others because I want to really dive into the editor. At the beginning of this video, you got a little bit of a taste of how much the C4 has to offer. It has traditional kind of subtractive synthesis. It has tons of filtering options, envelope options, LFOs. It has sequencers. It even has a little bit of FM synthesis built in. And consequently, I want to focus this video going block by block inside the editor to really understand what's happening under the hood on the C4. So let's not waste any more time, let's jump into this. Here's my bass's dry tone, Dingwall ABZ six string on the neck pickup with Tomastic Infeld flats. <laughs> So as you can see on my inset screen over here, the C4 editor can be a little bit daunting. Even for someone like me that's relatively well-versed in synths, this is a lot of knobs and a lot of buttons to click on. However, we are actually going to scroll down all the way to the bottom and talk about this block right here, the pitch detector block. So the pitch detector block doesn't really affect the audio, it just affects the tracking. You have choice of which input you're using for your audio input, and then you have what your lowest note is going to be set to. Mine is set to my low B. You have your highest note, which mine is set to the 24th fret on my high C string, and then you have two different tracking modes, one being faster and one being higher accuracy. For this entire video, I'm going to leave it on faster tracking because I like to play shorter staccato lines, and I find this works really nicely for that. Scrolling back up to the top of the editor here, these are kind of our global parameters or our master controls. We have input one and two's volume. Now this of course is volume, but it also is going to affect the sensitivity of the envelopes because this volume is sent into the envelope. Then this master switch right here is your master depth. And for most of this video, I kind of choose to leave this cranked all the way and then control depth later on with individual depth controls below. But it is useful if you want to just dial back the depth of everything all at the same time. This is very important. This chooses whether you are going to be adjusting things with the envelope side or the LFO side or any mixture in between. So you can have it controlled by envelopes and LFOs at the same time if you so choose. These last couple controls are pretty self-explanatory. We have a bass and a treble control. These are just kind of general EQs for the overall sound of the pedal. We have a, a wet or dry mix here. This is very useful, but to be honest, I leave it on wet almost all the time because I can kind of control the mixture of how much dry signal I get with the voice controls down here. 
The next knob though, low retain wet, is a very unique and very cool feature, especially for bass players. This is rolling in just low end of your dry signal. And I've talked about this in other videos in the past. I'm not a big fan of just kind of rolling in all of my dry signal all the time, especially with things like fuzzes and synths. So this is rolling in just the low end. So if your sound that you have sounds a little bit thin, a little anemic, this is a great way to just bring back some oomph in the bottom of the sound. And then finally, we just have the output volume. This is just setting kind of the master level of your patch and then output balance. This is controlling which side left or right if you're using both outputs, which for this video, I'm doing 100% everything in mono. So the output balance doesn't really matter here. It's time to start getting into the fun side of the pedal, which is the four voices that this thing gives you. Four, you heard that right. Not one, not two, not three, but four, which is pretty rad if any of you are familiar with analog synthesizers. So I have my first voice turned on. It's very simple. We can click voices on or off here, just like I am right now. And I have this patch set up as an initialized patch. I find this to be just general settings that are good at starting ground for everything. So right now you can kind of hear if I have this off, I don't hear anything, but if I click it on, my bass comes through. So now my bass is being routed directly to the output. So if I want to route through the filter, I would go over here and I would route to the filter. If I want to route through the distortion and the filter, then I would change it to distortion and filter. And you actually can see it in here, they give you these really convenient kind of little um, indicators of which voices are being sent where. So if I go directly to the output, you can see there is no voice one on the distortion or filter side down here. But if I put it in the filter, it pops on filter. And if I put it in distortion, it pops on both. So the first thing I want to talk about is what the C4 brings to your dry bass. When I got the C4, I was expecting it to be a pretty badass synth pedal, but I had no idea how much it was going to offer for dry bass effects. So things like distortions and filtering and tremolo are all inside the C4. Let's start off with some filtering. So I've gone over here and I have clicked on my MF-101 preset. Now, I made this to sound as close as I could in a short period of time to my beloved Moog MF-101 low-pass filter. However, if anyone has ever used that pedal, they know that it's like this big, and they also know that it can make a lot of noise and just in general be kind of annoying to play with, but I have never found a filter that has an envelope that, that responds as quick and as snappy as the MF-101s, and the C4 nails that tone. So let's hear a little bit of what this sounds like, and then I'll discuss the patch. <laughs> So now that you've heard that little sound sample, let's kind of talk about what I'm doing to build this patch and let's talk about what knobs relate to the mono input right here. So the mono input is just your dry bass or your dry guitar. You have a level knob here. This, as far as my ears can tell, does not affect the sensitivity of your envelope. So if you turn this up and down, you are affecting the sensitivity of your envelope. If you're turning this up and down, however, it is not affecting the sensitivity, just the volume of your input. You have a processor pan. This is useful for all of the inputs, not just your dry bass. This is essentially sending your signal either to the left side, which is processor one and processor two in filter and distortion, or if I roll it this way, we can see that now I am going through processor two. So the second distortion, second filter. And then of course you can actually blend between them as well, which is pretty rad. The tremolo we will talk about in a second. Every single voice can have tremolo applied to it. It's a really cool kind of side feature that I wasn't expecting. It essentially allows you to do a little bit of amplitude modulation along with um, filter modulation at the same time. These three knobs have nothing to do with the dry signal. So we'll talk about those in a minute. Now, lastly, I am routing this to the distortion and the filter. So let's talk about the distortion block. It's pretty simple. We have a drive amount, how much distortion. We have a clean mix, essentially. So this is another place where you can blend in your clean signal if you want, but this is only in regards to the distortion. I have it 100% wet. And then the output of the distortion block, which was a little confusing to me. So this is down all the way. It's essentially another place to boost or pull back the volume of your signal. There's a lot of gain staging inside the C4. And then this drop down menu is what gets us into all of our pretty rad distortions, which we're going to talk about more in a second here. 
onto the filter. And we're gonna dig into this more throughout the video, but just a quick rundown. We have a depth of the filter, so how much the envelope or LFO is filtering or moving your cutoff frequency of your filter. Then this is our cutoff frequency of the filter, and then this is the resonance or the Q of the filter. We can invert the envelope at any time, so we can make it go downwards instead of upwards. We have a ridiculous amount of filters to choose from here in this filter drop-down menu. And then here we are controlling either with LFO and envelope one or LFO and envelope two. I'm using envelope and LFO one here. And remember, you choose between envelope and LFO one by this knob up here for your preset. So if I'm going all envelope, all LFO, or somewhere in between. So now that you've heard the sound and I've talked through kind of what all these blocks are doing briefly, I wanna show a couple things that happen when I change them on the fly, specifically this invert button. So right now I am going upwards with my envelope, kind of a classic envelope like this. If I invert though, it's going to go down. And also I'm gonna to have to raise my frequency quite a bit here because since it's going down, it's gonna be pushing into those big subby frequencies. So one more thing to talk about with just this particular patch and the filter section in general that I was frankly shocked that Source Audio included, which is this pitch tracking option on the filter. This is something I've never seen on a synth pedal, but it's on a lot of synthesizers. And what this is doing is a little bit tricky to explain if you're not used to understanding how synthesis works. But if I click on one octave pitch tracking, essentially it is moving the cutoff frequency of the filter in relation to what pitch I'm playing. So if I have this off, it's just a standard static cutoff frequency. So it sounds like what it sounded like so far. But if I put pitch tracking on at an octave, it essentially is matching my pitch and moving the cutoff frequency per note that I'm playing. What this is going to do essentially is in lower registers, the cutoff frequency is going to be lower and in higher registers, the cutoff frequency is going to be higher. I could keep talking about every single patch in 100% detail, but we will be here literally all day. So I'm gonna move on here to another filter option. This one you can see I've named Bubblytron. And as you can imagine, this is kind of a funky bubbly Mutron style envelope. Now notice that on the MF-101, it was a four pole and on the Bubblytron, it is a two pole. I have also changed kind of my envelope style here. So instead of being that snappy envelope, we'll talk more about envelopes in a minute. I'm using more of uh, just kind of a standard envelope here and compared to that really snappy, quick envelope I was using on the 101. So to be clear, you could take your dry bass and put it through any of these filters with none of the oscillators, no synthiness, and you would just have an incredibly versatile filter pedal. And in fact, the Source Audio Spectrum Intelligent Filter is 100% inside the C4. So if you have the C4, you have all of those Spectrum presets or Spectrum options as well. But I don't wanna stick around and do just filtering today, but I am gonna do one more that is just filters because it's something I've wanted in a pedal for a very long time that I've missed for quite a while. So this preset is meant to kind of emulate the Pigtronics EP2, their envelope phaser. And one thing that that pedal did that I always loved is that you could control the phaser with an envelope or an LFO or both combined, which is what I've done here. So if we go to the top, we see that I have my envelope or my mod source here kind of in the middle. So I'm controlling a little bit more with LFO. So it's that classic sweeping phaser sound, but I also have some envelope in there. So you're gonna hear that when I pluck, it's gonna be kind of kicking up the uh, frequency, but it's also gonna be sliding back and forth from the LFO. Otherwise, pretty much like my other filter settings here, I have you know a three-stage phaser chosen instead of a two-pole or four-pole low-pass filter though. <laughs>
So again, I'm gonna apologize for the length of this video. Like I said, this thing is crazy dense. I haven't even touched the oscillators yet, but we have already gotten into tons and tons of wicked sounds. And we're gonna keep going down that route with no oscillators, more dry bass action. And we're gonna talk about the distortions really quickly here. So unsurprisingly, Source Audio is very well known for being good at making digital emulations of distortions. And they've put quite a few interesting distortions inside the C4. Now, of course, you can use any of the filters or distortions with the synthier sounds, but with just your dry bass, it is incredibly cool. And we can get some really synthy sounds with no kind of synthiness implied. So really quickly, I wanna kind of show the mild side of the distortion block, and I'm routing my dry signal into the distortion with the mild distortion set with very low drive, because even with the mild setting, if you get up to like even 20%, there's a lot of hair on your note. But let's hear what this mild setting sounds like. Cycling through a little bit here, so getting off the mild mode, if we go to something like heavy and bassy, this is kind of in my ears a little bit muff inspired. <laughs> Next one is very near and dear to my heart, and this is the sample reducer. Yet again, another cool feature I was not expecting and very happy to see in the C4. So I've actually made a preset for this one. I just called it Bit Crusher, and this is pretty simple. The drive knob is how much you're reducing the sample rate overall. I love this sound. It's not going to be for everybody, but I love it. And just to be complete, that's a pretty mild sample reducing setting. If we crank this drive knob up, it's full on whacked out bit crushing nasty. I'm gonna really quickly run through a few of the other distortions just because I feel like it's easier to understand what a distortion is doing on your kind of dry instrument than it is when you have like a bunch of oscillators running into it. So here's their gated fuzz setting, nice, crisp, funky gated fuzz. <laughs> We have three different kind of a, the signature source audio fold over distortion settings here. I'm gonna go to double fold over just for fun. And eh, you know what, let's go triple fold. And this is gonna be super out there industrial fuzzy with kind of some synthiness implied. <laughs> One more quick feature to show with our dry bass here is just the tremolo knob. Now the tremolo can be applied to everything, not just the dry bass, but it is essentially just a tremolo and this is controlling the depth of the tremolo and then what is controlling kind of the style of the tremolo is the LFO. And you can see we can choose between LFO1 or LFO2, which is very cool. So we can have amplitude modulation in kind of two different ways uh, depending on how we set up our voices. But let's just roll this halfway up. We get a nice kind of warm, subtle tremolo. Cranking the depth, obviously, gonna be more drastic. And then if we come down here to the LFO section, which we'll talk about a lot more here in a minute, we can of course change all kinds of things, like we could make it a square wave LFO. We can do cool stuff where like our volume will control the speed of the LFO. We 
We also can control depth, which we'll get into in a little bit. So you kind of get the idea. The tremolo here is a tremolo. If anytime you want to, you have the option to throw this on any of your voices. All right, that's enough with my dry bass. Everyone is here for synth sounds. Let's get into some synthy sounds. So if we click on our input window, this also kind of blew my mind. What? <laughs> this is a lot of different options. So we have a polyphonic pitch. We have a monophonic pitch, which is not the same as mono input, by the way. Then we have a saw wave, square wave, and sine wave. Now these are identical. At first I thought it was like two different options of saw, two different options of sine. But essentially what this is, is only one voice can have sine one, only one voice can have sine two. So you can never have more than two sine waves or two saw waves or two square waves at the same time, but you can have four voices all at the same time. Starting with the ones that I think people will kind of use less are the monophonic pitch shifters. So this is modeled off of analog monophonic pitch shifters. So things like an analog octaver, like the beloved OC2, for instance, or old school analog octave up pedals that actually, actually create kind of a clean octave up. So if I go over here, I have control of the shifting side of things. So you can see I can go plus, minus, up to three octaves, and then we can change from just octaves to any semitone in here, which is pretty rad. And we also have options to set it to be harmonized, which I will talk about later. So instead of a fixed interval, it's actually set to a key. So let's hear what a little bit of this analog octave up sounds like, and I'm going to play with the filter knob a little bit as I'm doing that. So you can hear it go from being dark to bright to a little bit brassy on the top. Octavers are more known for being octave downs, and in the bass community and anyone who watches my channel, they know that there is the beloved Boss OC2. So this pedal, the C4, can do a really good emulation of the OC2. Now, I personally love my OC2 so much, it will never leave my board, but this is kind of my take on that classic OC2 style pedal. And notice that on my monophonic pitch, I have now gone down an octave instead of up an octave. <laughs> The other way that everyone knows I like to use my OC2 or my analog octavers is I always use it without my dry bass. So let's hear a little bit of that. Now, of course, you have distortions, you have filters. So anyone who watches my channel, you know that I like to take my OC2 and run it into fuzz pedals, into filters to get my synthy bass sounds. You could do that on this pedal if you want to. And just to give you a really quick example of one of my favorite things, you could take this OC2 sound and run it into a sample reducer, which is something I absolutely love the sound of. So let's hear a little bit of just that pure wet into a sample reducer. <laughs> Moving on real quickly from the monophonic pitch shifters, we are going to talk now about the polyphonic pitch shifters. Now, this is an interesting pitch shifter. I would not say this is the kind of thing that you're going to emulate like a EHX hog or pog or a Digitech whammy, for instance. They're more kind of, in my opinion, they're made to be more for like textural sounds, not so much like quick, fast tracking pitch shifters, but they are polyphonic. So this is a particular patch I'm gonna use just to kind of show off the poly pitch settings a little bit. So you can see here I have my mono input on, so my dry bass, and then I have two different polyphonic pitch shifters. But notice that one is set to an octave up and one is set to a fifth up. So I have a fifth and an octave up at the same time. I also have the envelope being controlled by all three things here 
by envelope one. And if we scroll down, envelope one is right here. I'll talk more about the envelopes in just a second, but I have this set on a swelling envelope. So this is kind of a nice pad setting if you want just some nice textural work. <laughs> Moving on, finally, from the mono input, let's select saw one. Now notice something that happened automatically. It turned on an envelope, and the reason is, is if you don't have an envelope turned on, there is nothing to stop or start this saw wave, so it will just be running constantly. The only thing I can do is turn the level up or down to stop it. So let's turn that envelope one back on, because you need the envelope to tell it when it's going to start or stop the note. I have this set on a pretty fast, snappy envelope. We're going to explore envelopes here in a minute. So let's just hear a little bit of what saw one sounds like by itself, no filtering, no distortion, nothing. It's what we'd expect. It's a nice brassy, buzzy saw wave, but what I hope you notice is that the tracking on the C4 is crazy good. Now, of course, there's still gonna be artifacts, there's gonna be flub notes, but if your technique is clean, this thing tracks insanely fast and it tracks easily down to my low B. So with any of our oscillators, we can do the same thing we could do with, with, with the monophonic pitch shifters. We can take them up or down three octaves with any semitone in between or using any of the harmony settings. So one thing I'll do real quick here is let's drop this sucker down an octave. Nice and fat. Let's change this over to a square wave just to hear that sound for a second. Nice round open square wave. And then finally, the other option we have is a sine wave. Now, the sine wave by itself is basically gonna be used, in my opinion, to be kind of a fattening part of your signal. It doesn't have a lot of harmonic character, so it's just going to fatten up a patch, unless we touch this FM knob, which we'll get into in a minute. So here's the sine wave by itself. So you can hear, even though it's set to my dry bass's pitch, it's hard to hear this sucker when I'm on my lower notes, and that's because there's no upper end harmonics. It's a pure sine wave. If we kick it up a couple octaves, though, we get this nice kind of like upper octave whistle. All right, I have two saw waves on now here. I've turned on my second voice. I have them set on the same envelope, so they're responding the same way, which we can change, of course. And now I'm gonna have one set at my dry basis signal and the other one also set at my dry basis signal. And you'll hear that it doesn't really sound a whole lot different than a single saw wave. but that's where we get this lovely detune knob. So the detune knob, of course, allows us to slightly offset the pitch of one, which gives us that lovely coursing like phasing. So notice I barely turned this knob and notice how much more rich and open these two saw waves together sound. <laughs> And now to go further with this, of course we could crank it way up and we get some pretty wacky detuning. But let's go back to a more normal setting here. If I click modulate, what this is now doing is essentially according to the LFO, it is wiggling this knob back and forth. So I'm going from like more extreme detuning and then back to less extreme and over and over again. So without modulate on, it's just static detuning. With modulate on though, it sounds like this. Let's 
So you can hear that beating frequency, and that is controlled by the LFO. So if I roll the speed back here on the LFO, it's a slower beating frequency. Crank the speed, it's gonna be super fast and wobbly. So let's fatten things up a lot. So I have my two voice saw, both set at the same pitch, but one is detuned, already nice and warm, fat sounding sound like this. But now let's put on a square wave sub oscillator. So the square wave is set to be down an octave. And just for fun, I'm gonna detune this guy a little bit too. Just to show that this is a possibility, of course, we could turn up tremolos on all of these voicings and now, all these voices, and now we're going to have kind of some amplitude modulation going on with our oscillators. So this is a good time to talk about this particular lovely feature of the LFO, which is that you can restart it or reset it depending on the envelope one's trigger. So the envelope one is triggering the volume of all three of my oscillators. And if I turn this off and I have a slow tremolo going, you'll hear I kind of have to be aware of where the cycle of the tremolo is. So if I come in at the wrong spot, I'm actually going to come in when there's no volume and it'll sound a little weird. You can kind of hear how I'm missing certain notes in those runs. If I click restart, though, every time I pluck a note, the tremolo is going to restart its cycle. So now no matter where I play, I'm not going to get lost in the dip of the tremolo. This also becomes incredibly useful if you're using the sequencers because it will start the sequencer every time you pluck a note rather than the sequencer just running in the background all the time. I think I've talked about the oscillators enough now to give you a good idea of what they're capable of, but I do want to dig into the envelopes because the Source Audio's C4 envelope section is pretty crazy as well. So you can see that I have voice three and voice four on square wave kind of sub oscillators, one detuned a little bit from the other, and I have them being controlled by envelope one, which is right here. Now, envelope one and all of my envelopes for this video are gonna be controlled by audio input one. Now, for some people, this might be confusing why they even give you this option, but this is an incredibly cool feature. Yet again, one of these kind of above and beyond things that Source Audio brought with the C4. So. One annoying thing about envelopes with your instrument is if you're running anything into the C4 prior, like let's say you wanted to run a distorted bass into the C4, the distortion is gonna mess up your uh, dynamic control. So the envelope is gonna be thrown off. So I could split my signal at the front of my chain, put the split dry bass signal into audio input two, and then no matter what I'm running into the C4, I would always have my dry bass triggering the envelope. Another very useful option for audio input two would be if you want to side chain your envelope. So you could take any audio source, like a kick drum from your drummer's kick drum, plug it into the side, and now you'd have that classic kind of house side chaining um, kick drum sound where every time the kick drum hits, my amplitude would go up or down, however I want it to be controlled. Very, very cool feature. So next up, we have the envelope window. And as you can see, we have quite a few different envelope options, also including ADSR envelopes, which is pretty rad. Now, if you're not familiar with what an ADSR is, this is not an envelope that is explicitly being controlled by your instrument's dynamics. Your instrument's dynamics are triggering the envelope, but then the envelope has a set shape. So in other words, sometimes you'll notice that maybe you wish that even if you're still holding the note, you wish the volume would decay faster than your instrument is actually decaying. Well, that's where an ADSR comes in. You could set a set curve of what the volume is gonna be like, and you pluck, it starts that envelope, and then it just does its own thing after there. So the ADSR envelopes are cool if you want more of like a very particular shape to your sound. Now you can't set your own ADSR, but they do give you six different options of what those are going to kind of sound like or function like. 
Now, my personal favorite envelope, the one I use the most, is the one that's labeled snappy, and this is the one that gives you kind of the quickest, fastest attack. And as far as I can tell, you're adjusting both the attack and decay with the speed knob with this particular envelope. You'll see that some of them are labeled where it kind of explicitly tells you. For instance, this says fastest attack, and you're adjusting the decay, so the attack is set at the same level the whole time, and this knob would only be adjusting your decay. Now you always have control of sensitivity, so like how sensitive the envelope is to your incoming instrument signal, which yet again is also impacted by your input level up here, just to be aware. And then you have a gate, and the gate is something that might not be obvious right off the bat, but I wanna show why there's a gate on here. This might be a little bit tough to hear if you're not listening through headphones, but if I have the gate off and I let go of my bass, any noise my bass makes is going to make the oscillator start ringing. So like if I tap my neck, you can hear that you kind of have this background noisy issue. If I turn up the gate though, it goes away. So the gate is just a noise gate or basically a threshold of how loud your signal has to be to start the envelope. And it's pretty sensitive. So like you, I mean, there's a lot of range in here, but I feel like it's kind of either on or off in my opinion, for my bass at least with its output. But I always like to have a little bit of gating on so that when I'm not playing, it's dead silent. And then when I want to play, it hops in right where I want it to be. Now on this patch, on the other side, I have two sawtooth voices that are up an octave and two octaves, but notice they are being controlled by envelope two, not envelope one. I go down to envelope two, you can see that instead of snappy, I have this one that's labeled ADSR slow attack fast decay, and I have it on the slowest of slow attacks. So if I pluck a note here, instead of coming in really quick and immediate, it's going to be this nice slow swell of those upper, upper oscillators. Cool things happen though when we turn on all the voices because now I'm going to get an immediate subby square wave and then as my note is held those higher oscillators are going to fade in. So we haven't even touched the filters yet, and hopefully you're seeing that the options are almost overwhelming. You have so many cool things we can do with just the tremolo, the four voices, the envelopes, how we route them, how we're routing our envelopes. We haven't even, not even talking about distortions and filters. You have a incredibly wide sound palette to play with here. So before I start just kind of cycling through sounds, I want to show off one other feature that I couldn't believe existed in the C4, and it it honestly, I would almost keep the C4 on my board just for this, and that is this knob right here. So this F knob stands for FM synthesis, and if you're not familiar with FM synthesis, I highly, highly would recommend you go and watch my video on the Iron Ether FM Iron because I go into a little bit more explanation of that, but this is kind of like ring modulation, but instead of being amplitude controlled, it is controlling the frequency. So we're adjusting the frequency of one oscillator very fast, with another oscillator or with our dry bass. And you get some very cool sounds coming out of that. So I have pulled up a preset that's called Funky FM. And what's happening here is this FM knob only functions with sine waves. And because in general, you don't really want to do FM with something besides a sine wave because it gets crazy brash and kind of uncontrollable very quickly. But let me just show you what's happening. So I have the oscillator that you're hearing is sine two. And you can see here that it is being controlled by sine one, not my input signal. And you can control it with the input signal and I'll show you what that sounds like, but that's a crazier kind of wacky version of FM. Sine if you control it with another oscillator that is also set to your pitch, it's going to be a much more musical style of FM. So controlling the FM amount, if the FM is off, you're just hearing that sine wave oscillator and that little sub oscillator I put on there. Okay. If I roll up FM though, I'm going to start getting more and more FM modulation. Now currently I'm controlling the FM modulation with my input signal. So it's going to be a little bit different than if I control it with the other sine wave, but here's what that sounds like. So you can hear it's really, really sensitive to how hard I pluck. Now, let's switch this sucker over to be controlled by the other oscillator because that's where things really get cool. So now this 
sine two oscillator, its FM amount is, or its FM modulation is being controlled by this sine one oscillator. And so that's what this sounds like as it's set up currently. So, so funky. Now, the cool thing about being able to control the FM with another oscillator is that I have options of setting the pitch of this oscillator. So right now you can see that I actually have this sine wave, the one you're hearing, is set to be equal to my dry basis pitch. But the one that's doing the FM modulation is an octave down. And if I take it up an octave, the sound changes drastically. So it goes from this to this. The higher we go in harmonics, the more kind of glassy and brash the FM gets. And honestly, for my ears, I wouldn't go up much more than an octave because it gets kind of crazy pretty quickly. Another very cool thing about FM in this pedal is that I'm controlling the amplitude of my carrier oscillator, the one you're hearing with envelope one, which is a snappy envelope set to be very, very, very fast. And then I'm controlling the modulating oscillator with a different envelope, which is going to change how the FM comes in and out. So right now I have it on a, on a kind of a slower snappy, but let's make this more extreme. Let's go to swell. So currently if I have it on the snappy envelope, it's sounding like this. But if I go to swell, So in the FM world, you can kind of think of this oscillator's amplitude as being equivalent to kind of the filter or f frequency cutoff on a filter and more tr traditional subtractive synthesis. Sorry, I can't talk. So another preset here using some FM, I have this glassy FM, and this is kind of doing exactly what I was just showing. I have a snappy envelope on my carrier oscillator and a swelling envelope on my modulating oscillator. <laughs> So if you want some FM synthesis in your life, you got it along with all your subtractive synthesis in the C4. All right, it's time to move on to some just preset patches that I have made or taken from other people and kind of modified. And I'm gonna talk about other elements of the pedal as I cycle through some of these patches. First up, we gotta talk about my favorite lovely Blade Runner brass patch here. So this is something I always love with any synth pedal. I love slow sweeping sawtooth oscillators, which is exactly what we're doing here. We have a saw one and saw two slightly detuned from each other. They're both being controlled by a very slow envelope. And also the filter is being controlled by that similar very slow envelope as well. Just a nice subtle two pole low pass filter here. Here's what it sounds like by itself. Now this patch really shines when it's being run into a lot of delay or a lot of reverb. So I'm going to run this on a pretty big delay on my Strymon Volante. Next up, this is just your classic big fat subtractive synth kind of mean sounding swelling synth sound. So I have a two sawtooth oscillators, one down an octave, and then I also have a square oscillator down an octave. And then I'm running those both into a six pole low pass filter, six pole low pass filter. If you're not familiar with synths, that's kind of unusual and it sounds very, very thick. And then I'm also controlling this with mostly envelope, but I have a little bit of LFO in there just to kind of give it a little bit of a kind of a pulse on top of the note. All 
So this next patch is actually the only patch I'm gonna show that is using the sequencer. And that's because honestly, I'm not a big user of sequencers, but also the sequencer is very particular. Whatever pattern you happen to set up is going to completely change what the patch sounds like. And I could make hundreds of sequencer patches that all sound a little bit different. But let's talk about the sequencer for a second. So we have presets that Source Audio has given us, which are kind of just nice, funky presets, which I'm actually using here. I'm using two, I believe, of the groove settings here. You also can manually slide the pitch of every single step up and down and make whatever sequence you would like to make. We also can choose if it's going to be two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 16 steps. So kind of where it happens to um, stop at every single time. And then yet again, this control on the LFO also affects the sequencer. So if I have this clicked, every time I play a new note, the sequence starts over from the beginning, which is a cool feature. The other thing you're gonna notice about the sequencer is that the way it interacts with envelopes is pretty rad because I have my filter control here being set to be controlled by this really slow envelope but each sequenced note kind of individually pops the filter a little bit too, and you'll really hear that on the decay. One real quick thing to take note of in that last sequencer patch is that I have two different sequencers going. I have sequencer one and sequencer two. The sawtooth and the square wave oscillator are being controlled by one or two, respectively. Very cool. Two different sequencers that you can combine and make some pretty rad sounds with. This next one is just entitled Funky Saws because that's what it is. It's two sawtooths that are controlled by a nice snappy envelope running into a filter that now has a little bit of peak filtering happening here, which gives it kind of almost that vocal quality. And this is, um, in my opinion, it's kind of on the vibes of like more like 70s vintage style synthesis. <laughs> This is the first time in the video I'm talking about the harmonizer. If we scroll down here to the harmonizer block, we can choose a key. I've chosen D. We can choose a tuning. In this case, I have chosen chosen. I've chosen major, and then I have two different interval options that I can set to pretty much anything I want. And I have it set on a third and a second, so really tight intervals here. Now this is set to a diatonic key. So for instance, if I play the note D, my third would be a major third, but if I played the note E, my note would be a minor third. Pretty rad. If I scroll up to my voices here, you can see that voice one is using the interval plus harmony two. So this is the one that's hitting that second. This is interval plus harmony one, so that's hitting the third. And then I just have a standard octave up and then also an octave up plus a fifth. So what's happening here is every time I pluck a single note, I'm getting a diatonic kind of oscillated version of the one, the two, the three, and the five of whatever chord I happen to be playing. And for me, this is a really cool way to kind of get that um, like chord stab you might get in a lot of house music, for instance. You also can hear that I have this set on a very short ADSR envelope. Yet again, ADSR means that even if I'm holding my note, the envelope will shut. So to show you what I mean here, I'm holding the note. That's as much sustain as I get. It's quick. I could make it really quick, for instance, where I get almost no sustain. Or I could make it a little bit longer on this side.
This one is honestly in here kind of almost just for humor. I kind of stole this actually from one of the Neuro presets. Another really cool feature of Source Audio Pedals, if you're not familiar with, is that they have kind of this online community where everyone can go and upload their presets. And I found this one, so I couldn't resist downloading it and trying it out, and I tweaked it a little bit for myself. Also, I will upload all of the presets I'm showing here onto those Neuro presets after I'm done with this video, just so you know. But this is kind of a take on the classic genuine pony sound. So this is a patch that I also got from the Neuro app community, and this is from the great Nathan Navarro. He did a kick-ass version of kind of your classic acid bass sound. Pretty simple patch. It's just a square wave and a sine wave running into a six-pole low-pass filter with an ADSR envelope. Let's hear what that sounds like. <laughs> This preset is kind of a mix of everything we've talked about so far. I have two saw wave os oscillators kind of happening in more traditional subtractive synth where I'm running them in to the six pole low pass here. And I'm controlling the filter with both the LFO set on a square wave, but also the envelope. And then I'm also doing some FM modulation or FM synthesis happening on these two sine wave oscillators with a slightly faster envelope. Let's hear what that sounds like. <laughs> So shooting this demo honestly was pretty hard. As you can see, there's lots of things that we can tweak here. And my goal with this video was to hopefully give everyone an overall understanding of what's happening with all of these blocks, knobs, sections, buttons, etc. Now, there's a lot of little features that I missed, I'm sure. Like, I don't think I actually talked about the LFO2, for instance, which is kind of tied to LFO1. We didn't get into some of the specifics of the harmony settings or the sequencer settings. But hopefully, after watching this video, you can go home and have fun programming your own patches on the C4. So if you enjoyed this demo of the Source Audio C4, please like, subscribe, share, all that good stuff. It really does help me out. And I will be back very shortly with more videos. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.